think it should be around 45 minutes or so. Um, how many people have heard of Marketo? That's a lot of people. That's great. Um, I am uh, Glenn Lipka. I'm the user experience, not as user interface, but all the different touch points that a customer has, how they get trained, how they... Um, a great example is we had this letter that went out to people in Texas saying, we have Nexus in Texas, which means you have enough business in Texas, you have to charge sales tax. And the first letter that went out to them got a lot of complaints, saying, I don't want to pay this, you're just nickel and diming me. So I helped them rewrite the letter that told the story of how taxes were formed and things like that. And uh, after that, there were no more complaints about paying sales tax. They said, oh, I understand, and I can pay that. So user experience is not just about the product. It's about how people interact with you as a company. So I work with a lot of different departments. What I'm going to focus on is mainly product things, but it actually works for all kinds of things. When something goes from an idea to actual reality, it's how decisions get made. I'll talk about all the different facets of that. Um, you'll laugh, you'll cry, it'll be great. Okay, how many people here make presentations in PowerPoint, like or some slide where? Okay, it's just totally off topic. Google Images. This is the way that this is the way that a slide is, slides are supposed to be. Big picture, one, two words. Notice how there's not bullet points here, right? Bullet points are the death of people, death by bullet point. They're bullets, you know, you hear bullets, they're, they're killing. So what you gotta do is use pictures. And the reason is people cannot read and listen at the same time, it uses the same part of the brain. You can look and listen at the same time, much easier. So what you should do is back up what you're saying with pictures, don't put your notes and stream of consciousness on the screen, otherwise they have a choice, either read or listen to you, you don't want that. So when I make presentations, I usually go to Google Images and I'm trying to find something that matches a particular concept, and I find a picture that I like, and usually that becomes the centerpiece of the presentation, and I work all the other pictures into that same theme. In this case, it was like small children and babies. I mean, this picture is just, it's too cute, right? So you have to make a whole presentation on that. This has nothing to do with decisions or products or anything, but there's like a theme. And I highly recommend that in your presentations, pick a theme, Google Images, they're all free. All right. The stages of design. The idea part, I can't walk too far away from this. The idea part is pretty quick. Um, we're gonna go over how does that happen, how to deal with those very first stages. The design part, is I usually call that the conceptual design, like just roughly speaking, how is this thing gonna work? Um, and then the long tail part is the actual design. This is the little nitty gritty details, the devil is in the details. That's why that takes 80% of the time. You're 80% of the way done by the concept design, but you're only 20% of the time done. Um, and so I'm gonna go through each one of these parts. First, the idea part. Starts with an executive has this great idea, right? Now, you know that look where it's just like, you know, what is this idea? And it's an executive sponsor. It could be a product manager. Very often, it's the CEO, right? And that the idea usually comes in the form of two words. I don't know why it's two words. It's never three words, never one word. It's like dynamic content, purposeful duplicates, archive folders. You know, like it's, I don't know why. It's always two words. And that's it. That's the idea. That is the full form of the idea. Maybe they draw some stuff on a whiteboard where they zoom into one particular area. Like there's a place where it's like minority report and you just grab stuff and drag it around. And th they're just like, okay, I'm glad I did the inspiration thing. See you guys later, let me know when it launches, right? And that's it, the executive sponsor is out. That's great, but there's no detail there, right? So the first part is about discovery. You have to listen to people about this idea. What does it mean to them? There's nuances about the ideas, right? Explore, do you mean like this version of that problem or that version of that problem? Great example of this, we, um, I, I, it was a small design. There was a, a thing that a salesperson was looking at and here's a list of the leads that they should call. And that what they wanted is for a particular name to go away. And so we interpreted that to mean that these were hot leads and that they want it to go away. So what that means is it's not a hot lead, it's a cold lead. Like they call them, this guy has no budget, it's not a hot lead, make them go away. But it turns out that wasn't the case at all. The case was I called them, they're a hot lead, I set up a meeting for next week, what do you want from me now? Like take it off my list, 
I called them. There's nothing more I can do with this person. By putting it there, it just means I have to scroll past it every day knowing that I'm not calling that person. It's not that they're not a hot lead or not. And so the original design had an ice cube. Oh, cool down the lead. They're not hot. Flames were hot. Ice cubes were cold. But snooze, you know, make it just kind of disappear for a week. That was a completely different thing. That was a clock. And so by exploring what the problem space is, exploring what this idea is really about, you will end up with very different designs, very different implementations. And it all comes from being skeptical and being really exploratory about what those, uh, what the problem is about, getting in the nuances. One key thing in there is uh, empathy. Don't think of it as the way you would think about the problem. Think about it the way that the person using it would think about the problem. Empathy is the strongest skill that a UX designer or a product manager has. To put themselves in the shoes of the person who is uh, doing the work, you're going to do a much better job overall. And that's all part of this discovery phase. And this is before anything happens. Like, this is all part of that idea part, right? Just understanding what this idea is really about. You have to understand what the current UX is. This is the way that I think a lot of, like when I see a problem, like, oh, we need to fix this problem, and I go and I look and see what they do currently. It's funny, because they think it's OK. They're like, oh, no, no, it's fine. You know, the current user experience is fine. I'm like, no, you're licking a pig. <laughs> That's not OK. And they were like, but I've been doing it for so long, and it's so much fun. And that's where you start to conceive, like, oh, this could be so much better. But you have to really understand what their current experience is, because how can you make it better than their current experience unless you learn about it? This, the kid doesn't look unhappy, right? It looks happy. <laughs> this is where I think product managers, I count on them so dearly to define the requirements, but not the solution. So in other words, there is a minimum viable of everything that we can possibly do. And knowing like it has to do, it has to achieve this goal, it has to achieve this goal, this goal is a nice to have. This one, it's like, eh, it's fine. If we have it, it's good. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. But being able to prioritize around what has to be in, this, in the system, it's really important. And so writing those down before you even have a conceptual design is important. Otherwise, the conceptual design will just make assumptions. You don't want to make assumptions. You want the product managers actually saying what it has to do. But you shouldn't say what the solution is. You shouldn't say, here's how you should solve the problem, you should just say there needs to be a solution to this problem. That's where people start sketching on paper. They're starting to write things down about how it could possibly be. This is a, a photograph from my own notebook, and it's, it's really messy, but it's, I'm just trying to get my idea out, I'm trying to put it next to somebody and say, some piece, like there's 40 pieces, but this piece number 12 sort of looks like this and you start to develop a common understanding about it. At that point, I'm starting to sketch on a whiteboard. Whiteboards are great, very messy. I know people take pictures of them a lot. I don't think taking a picture of anything that I put on the whiteboard, um, like, can you guys tell what that is? Me neither, and I made it. I, but I know it had something to do with uh, nurturing a lead. But at the time, it was helping to explain stuff. And it helped to get a better understanding of what needs to be in there, what doesn't need to be in there. And getting that on the whiteboard is a shared exercise between people of talking it through about how it could be. Right? And that comes up with what I call a conceptual design. It's basically not the design. You can't hand that off to engineering. But it's something saying, we're kind of in agreement that something like that is going to work, and that a designer can now sit down and and try to solve the problem using this rough sketch. Talking it out is a really important part of that, because when you're drawing it, what comes out is really interesting conversations around, oh, I thought it was going to be something like this. Well, why did you think that? Oh, because I talked to this guy, and he had this problem. And if you don't talk it out, Right? There's all kinds of information that doesn't travel back and forth. It's in those nuances that great products are made. You can have an adequate product if you have product managers write down the requirements, hand it to, an end, to a designer, and they make a design. But to have a great product, you really need a lot of bandwidth, a lot of communication between people, especially between the product managers and the designers. Between the two of them, you really need to talk out all these nuances. Sometimes also talking to customers to 
hear what they're saying, especially to see that current UX, but really talk it out, and sometimes argue it out. This wasn't kids, but it just seemed cute. The conversations meander. There's been so many times when I, we had a conceptual design like sort of halfway done and realized it was just completely screwed. And it was never going to work. And then we said, oh, let me, let's take it back in this other direction. And then we overcorrected and went too far. And, and in the course of doing that, the design meandered a lot. And you just have to keep throwing things away and keep iterating, keep building. Because you're never going to have the right solution the very first time. There are these moments when you're talking it out where everyone's eyes light up saying, oh, that's cool. Right? And that's when the magic happens. But if you don't let it sort of take its course and you, you see what's all the way over to one extreme and you see what's all the way on another extreme, you're never going to find that right sweet spot. But eventually, the ideas converge. They come together into a whole. And you say, that's the thing that we want to build. And this is before the design is really on paper, but everyone's understanding of it converged. There's a timing of that that is funny. I, people ask me, well, how long will it take before you converge? Right? And you don't know, but over time, you get a really good feel for it. Like the size, if the size of the project takes two man months to uh, execute, and I'm using very just vague language for you know, the mythical man month and all, but let's just imagine. You get the two man months to execute, it probably will take, let's say, uh, three quarters of that to converge. It really, it takes time. And a lot of people just want the design like, oh, I came up with the idea, can you have the design tomorrow? And the answer is no, and you have to work through those problems. But it usually takes, you know, there's almost as much time designing as there is executing, um, depending on what it is. Who's seen the movie? You know, for kids. Anyway, if you haven't seen the movie, I won't give it away, but this yeah. is, it's just awesome. Anyway, so that's the conceptual design. And this design is what he carried around because this was the plan. He didn't need more than this. Now, eventually, they had the blueprints, and they had all the details and the analysis about it, but this was the conceptual design. This was the plan. This is all that he needed to say, I know what to build. I'm sorry for the people who haven't seen the movie, but it's, uh, I won't great, give it away. Great. All right. Let's talk about the long tail part of the design. That took us from the idea all the way through just that first conceptual design part. This time we get to use computers. Up until this point, I literally have not used a computer at all for any part of the process. It was paper. It was um, on a whiteboard. There was a year of my life that I said, I should try to be good at prototypes. I keep hearing that prototypes are so cool, and I should really get good at it. And so these are the tools I tried. And I tried them with the thought in mind, I am going to master these tools and be really good at them, and I'm going to make prototypes work. So I didn't make any of them work. And the reason is because it just takes too much time to make a prototype. And it's also the wrong concept of how to explain things. It is not, like, at one point somebody was making a prototype, and I was like, you might as well just make the site. You know, it was for a website. And I was like, just make the site at that point. If it's, everything is clickable, I'm like, HTML is not that hard compared to some of these. It's like it didn't make any point. And I just tried so hard, even to the point of paper prototypes. Like, you draw things out, and you put them in front of people, and it's really fun and cute, and, you know, like, oh, this is the way it's going to work. And it just, it, it didn't work. Even, you know, you've seen this sort of prototype. It just took so much time to wire it up. And every time I wanted to make a change, it was just too much time. So I found, so I gave up, basically, after the year. And I came to the conclusion that prototypes have a terrible ROI. And that what's better is storyboards. This is how Pixar explains a movie. Um, they have pictures of the movie. And they have a guy with a uh, laser pointer or a stick. And he walks you through each step of the thing. And he tells a story. Um, there's a book, uh, Made to Stick. Right? It's all about how you get people to remember things. And stories is one of the ways you get people to remember things. Telling a story about the UI and walking through it is the best way to explain the feature or the product. Um, and that's the way we do them. I'll show you some examples. This is one that I was doing for dynamic content. The end result, actually, was, it was pretty big. Um, 
It took us six months and maybe 10 people working on it. I mean, it was, it was a very big project. I'm only showing you a couple of slides. And it was started October 20, oh no, it was last updated October 27th. It was started, yeah, July 1st, 2011. I guess they didn't update it. So this is the first page of the change log. This is super small, but right here, 819 changed everything. <laughs> This is page two of the change log. Like, these things get iterated on a lot because we're talking it out with engineers, talking it out with different people. And the way that they look is generally <laughs> like this. So what I did was I took a screenshot of the, of the app. Then I went into Photoshop and I erased everything. I erased all the tabs. I erased all of the tree nodes. I erased everything in the middle. And so I had just, um, and if I were to do Control A and delete, you'd have just kind of a blank wallpaper that looked like the app. And then I made, like, in a couple of weeks, and I did this a couple of years ago, all the little components that you have in the app, I made them in PowerPoint. So I made things that look like tabs, and I made things that look like a menu, and I made things that look like hover, and I made drop-down boxes. And it took me, like, you know, a week or two, and I did that a couple of years ago, and I've just been reusing them over and over and over and over again, because there's only so many uh, components that you use in your app. And so this is just a, p a ping of the hand, and I animate it in PowerPoint. I say, oh, go here. And the menu came down using peek down you know, as an animation in PowerPoint. And doing that takes seconds. I mean, it, you get really good at it. Um, when I hire UX designers, um, they're usually unfamiliar with this. And within a couple weeks, they're making them very fast. Um, another example would be, um, this is a modal. I didn't need the stuff behind it. But there's lots of call outs. Now, at Marketo, um, the MRD that we call is basically a definition of the problem and um, the opportunity and the priority. And it's basically saying from product management what we want to achieve. This document in PowerPoint we call the PRD. And it's basically the thing we hand to engineering saying, build this. right? And both documents are heavily influenced. Like the UX team owns this document, but the engineering team and the product management team heavily influence us. The MRD is owned by product management, but the UX team and engineering heavily influence them. The code is owned by engineering, but UX and PM both influence them on how they do that and how it's executed. To give you an example, like here's a modal, and here's a screenshot of that modal in the actual app. So I'll, I'll go backwards and forwards. Here's, you can see like there's a lot of details missing here. It's not pixel perfect. Things totally moved around and changed. Because at some point we just like, left the PowerPoint behind, and we're just sitting with the engineer saying, well, try it like this. That doesn't really work. And oh, we forgot about this use case that we need to deal with, and how do we do that? And so between the differences there, right? that's the difference between design and reality. right? The actual execution of it became uh, different. And that worked out really well. Because we don't want engineers to blindly just follow whatever the design says, just like we don't want designers to blindly follow some solution that a product manager says. We want people thinking. There's an, uh, an expression from a site, uh, creating passionate users. It's a cartoon. The more you use your reins, the less they'll use their brains. Right? You want thinking partners when you're at work. You don't want zombies. I think she calls it the zombie function, actually. OK, now in all of this, there's a million decisions that need to get made. And I would say amongst everything that I deal with and do or have done in the last five years, it's all just a collection of decisions. Like what product we have, it's a collection of decisions. This is probably the most important part of working at a startup. You make the wrong decisions, you end up with a rotten product, and you go, you go bankrupt. You end up with good decisions, you end up with a good product, make lots of money, all your dreams come true. All the decisions. Here's how I mentally think about decisions. It's, there's a pie chart. And in my mind, there's a slice of the pie that really matters to me. Everything else does not matter to me. So if I'm talking to a product manager or an executive, I want to talk about this area over here. And I want them to make every one of those decisions. What do you think the color of the button should be? You know, What do you think this label should say? I don't care. So I want them to have fingerprints on that thing. Talking to a CEO, this is the most valuable concept you can have. Decide what matters. Do not 
talk about that stuff with the CEO. Because he'll say what he thinks, because he has an opinion about it all, <laughs> right? And he'll say what he thinks, and he'll be like, that's not what I want. But if you talked about this and you took all of his decisions, he's going to feel like, this is excellent. You know, I'm getting great feedback into the product, but then the part that matters, the part that really is going to drive it from your point of view, is still kept pristine. Everyone has in their head a different pie. So when I'm talking to a product manager, as an example, their slice might be over here, or maybe it overlaps by 20%. Now, where that 20% happens is where the arguments happen. But you really want to be disciplined and say what really matters to me, what really matters to them, and make sure that you're not um, just trying to have all the decisions to yourself. I know you guys have heard the expression, the product manager is the CEO of the product, right? That is not a license for you guys to make every single decision, right? That's, it's, there's other people who work in the company and they want to make some decisions too. You guys have to decide what really matters and let them make other decisions. That's a healthy organization. We live in a you win some, you lose some world. There was a, 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 an example, if I wanted something blue and you wanted something We'll just go with yellow. We wanted something yellow, and we argued about it, where neither of us are going to be happy with green. It's not a compromise. That's not the middle, right? I have to win some. You have to win some. Somebody had told me that about marriage. Like, it's not about agreement. It's about you win some, you lose some. And it's the same thing with a product. And the truth is you uh, spend more time at work than you do with friends or family, right? So you want to have those bonds, and if you're eating up the whole pie, that's not a good working relationship. You have this concept at work, uh, it's very informal, that we call them uh, chips. And like, yeah, I'll come to that later, don't worry. All right, why do we disagree? I think we disagree for not a lot of reasons. I think there's just a few. The first one is that you have different data. If I think it's raining, and you think it's not raining, just because of our points of view, we'll make very different decisions. And so if I have data from, like this happened just today. Somebody had data at work about SEO saying people look for the word marketing software more than they look for marketing automation, like four times. And so we said, oh, we should make that decision. And then somebody else came in and said, no, that's actually wrong. It's broad match versus specific match or blah, blah, blah. And it turns out that wasn't the case. And that led us to a different decision, all based on different data. We're trying to decide with data, right? I mean, everyone loves decide with data. But if you have different data, you're going to have different decisions. And so when you're arguing with somebody, try to ask them, what is the data that's driving your decision? What did you hear? Is there an anecdote? Is there a, you know actual statistic? What's driving that? If you can understand where they're coming from, get common data, you can get common agreement. Sometimes you make different assumptions. If I think it's going to rain tomorrow, and you think it's not going to rain tomorrow, we'll end up planning something in our head very different. Now, in the beginning, we're both going to go home right, and start packing. But by the time we get to the day and that I've got all of my rain gear on and you've got all of your swim gear on, and we realize, oh, we're really in different places. And that assumption gap really becomes big later in the process. It's much easier to fix it over here, much harder to fix it downstream. So finding out what assumptions people are making is a key factor in getting agreement. Because you, you really don't want to agree at this point, because at that point, you have sunk costs. At that point, you're just like, I've just invested a whole series of things into this assumption. And if you're telling me that assumption is wrong, we don't want to unwind that. So now people have cognitive dissonance around, should I just keep going based on my assumption that may or may not be right? right? And that, that's just not where you want to be. So find out early on, what are the assumptions you're making about would people like it? What kind of problem is it solving? How are people going to use this thing? How many times are they going to use this thing? All of those assumptions really come into play. It makes a huge difference. You might be optimizing for something different. I'm optimizing for this bird. You might be optimizing for that bird. And then we have a disagreement of how we should execute on the feeding feature. This happens all the time. It's a great, it's so easy to solve, though, if you realize that somebody is optimizing for the enterprise user, and you are optimizing for the first time user. Or they're, they're saying the power user needs to do something, and you're saying, no, the newbie needs to do something. You'll never come to the same agreement on what to do, 
if you have different assumptions about what you're optimizing for. And this might be, so this isn't even about an assumption. You might have the same assumptions and the same data. But you might say, I'm, I'm focused on this part of the use case, not on that part of the use case. And if somebody else is doing the opposite, you're going to argue. So if you could talk that through, saying, what are you optimizing for? What assumptions are you making? What data are you uh, collecting? You'll end up arguing less. And you'll be making smarter decisions with a whole better conversation. You'll literally be saying, who should we optimize for? Let's talk about that. Let's argue out who should we optimize for. But once you decide that, then you probably end up with the same decision of what to do about it. But if you're, you're not even talking about who to optimize for, and you're just talking about downstream effects of, well, I want this design, and I want that design, you're never going to be talking with each other. You're never going to get to that right conclusion. Isn't it so sad for the little bird? Sometimes it's just personal. Why are you disagreeing with me? Well, fuck you. That's why I'm disagreeing with you. There was this woman, Liz, and right, she was mad at me. She was mad at me because I was a dick. Right? So I, I, I found out that she was mad at me. because I, I literally didn't talk to her, and apparently she was mad at me for six months. Right? And so I pulled her into a conference room, and I said, I, I want to talk to you. And she's like, what? And I said, I want you to finish this sentence. Glenn Lipka is a complete asshole because <laughs> so she went a half hour, a good half hour, right? And I took all of it, and I said, one, I said, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, right? I said, he, I didn't mean that. That wasn't my intention. Let me tell you what I was thinking, right? And I explained to her what was in my head, what I was assuming, what I was optimizing for. And, but even though I was saying all of that, I was saying, but I'm still, I'm sorry. And I didn't mean for you to feel that way. And I mean to um, put you in that position. And I, there's no excuse. She got up. She gave me a hug. And she's been nice to me and hasn't disagreed with me every single time I talked to her since. Right? This is what sometimes you have to do. Right? This, is, this is being a grown up in the workforce. Right? You have to deal with people who are mad at you Right? And it could have come from all those other things. But sometimes it's just flat out personal. Right? And that there's no good for the company if two people don't like each other. Right? They're not going to agree for what good reason. I mean, why do we work? We work, we get paid so that we can do something for a company, make them money, create more jobs. We're there for a reason. And that reason is not served when we're disagreeing with each other based on those things. This is all communication. But when we get to a point of where we're actually talking about real problems, what should we assume? What data should we accept? What should we optimize for? Then all of a sudden, like, good decisions are going to get made. Good products are going to get made. And you can't wait till it's too late. I, I should have got the guy with the, uh, the hat, you know, the, the construction hat. Anyway, genius. So if, when things get built, Right? And you realize the assumption's bad. You realize you made a bad decision. It's the worst. Because, and there's a point where you literally, you're going to have to ship it anyway. And everyone knows that you're shipping something that is deeply flawed. Who here has shipped something they knew was deeply flawed? Yeah, everyone with their arms down is lying. You know you <laughs> shipped it. Apple, Apple, it yeah, right. <laughs> it's not one of my products. Exactly. <laughs> anyway. So getting this early makes all the difference in the world. Getting to those assumptions. This is all about communication. And I think that at Marketo, I played an important role of really trying to get breakthrough communication barriers. And I, I do it, and I try to add humor to it, and I try to do it in a way that is fun. But ultimately, it's all about getting to the heart of the issues, getting past uh, the bullshit to why are we making this decision? What is driving this decision? Because so many things, they kind of go through a bureaucracy, right? Why are we doing this? Well, because somebody said that we should do it. I rem remember a communications person said, um, here's our elevator pitch. And I emailed her saying, nobody's going to remember this. It's too long. I mean, unless the elevator is 200 floors, <laughs> right? You, this is too much to remember, and it's filled with jargon. And I said, you need it to be short, like a sentence, and a small sentence at that, a phrase. And she said, well, this has been approved by people pretty high up. 
You know, and that, that was it. That was her, that was her comeback. Right? And, and so she shipped that idea. Nobody remembered it. It came and went. But there was an opportunity, actually, to give people a good elevator pitch. Somebody's in an elevator and say, oh, what does Mark Hedo do? And they have a crap answer or no answer or an inconsistent answer. What good is that? Right? And so bad decision based on a bad communication process equaled lost opportunity. There's a million opportunities in every startup and every company. There's a million decisions that get made. It's this process that you either end up with something like that or you end up with something good, and it's all about communication. This is the part that I always hate, which is sometimes stuff that I love ends up not being in the product. right? It's nobody's fault. It's just the way things go. We can't build everything we want to build. This goes even some stuff that's in the slice of stuff that I think matters. And then it ends up on the cutting room floor. And then part of the decision making process requires that you cut things you love. This is where it's very important to really think about the kernel inside of that slice of the pie, that this is the most important thing that you can't lose. You have to decide what you want to put on the cutting room floor. So in that sense, you have to pick your battles. You cannot say everything that you want in your slice of the pie must be made the way that you want it and must ship. The, it just doesn't work out like that. But you have to be able to pick your battles. You can't just lay over and say, hey, everything I wanted isn't there because the CEO you know, he pushed us to deliver it, and everything is either half-assed or just not what I wanted. You have to be able to lay on the tracks sometimes. Now, when I say lay on the tracks, I mean lay on the tracks. Say, it's me or this decision. Now, with that, with that said, the way that I use, this is what I was saying, that concept of chips. So a lot of times I've said to the CEO, this is something I want to use my chips on. Right? These chips in the vaguest sense. Right? So I've earn, I earn chips by doing good things. I spend chips when people are really trying to cut the part of the pie that I love the most. I could usually pick one, let's say per quarter, maybe. Maybe three a year. Like You can't use your chips all the time. Use your chips all the time, people will be like, hey, you're, you're out of chips. You haven't done so much good stuff that you have so much backlog of chips. Now, the CEO seems to have like an, you know, like a, it's like a leprechaun behind him with chips that just keeps <laughs> filling it up, right? But he knows he can't use that argument all the time. He knows that he can't, right? And that what the chips thing does is it, it adds a level of humor to what would otherwise be a no. Like, you can't just do that to the CEO, right? You can't just say no. But you can say, this is something I want to use my chips on, in which what you're saying is, I care a lot about this. And you are trampling on it. And you need to back off on this. And let me have this, right? And I won't do this all the time, but you need to let me have this. You need to back off. You can't have that conversation with the CEO. But you can say, this is something I want to use my chips on. It sounds fine, right? And it's all about like creating a safe environment for the CEO to be magnanimous and say, fine, let him have that. And maybe he says, you know, this is 23 chips now, and it's uh, 10 chips later, because this is a big deal. And sometimes he says, listen, I know, if I say I want to use chips on it, and he just feels adamant that it shouldn't be, then we go back to those other sort of things. What are we assuming? What is the data that we're coming from? Why is he saying that he wants to optimize it for? But he takes it very seriously when we're in that situation. Um, but most of the time, it's fine. And I use the same thing with uh, people I manage. We use the same thing with engineers. We do the same thing with product managers. That it's basically a concept of you win some, you lose some. Sometimes I want to use my chips, and sometimes you want to use your chips. And that you can't use them all the time. This seems dangerous. Am I wrong? A little dangerous. No? <laughs> all right. I'm going to go into some design principles. And these help us make the decisions of when we um, are delivering things. First one is uh, a concept called don't move the cheese. It basically means if somebody is used to doing something by, let's say, clicking a link at the top right, don't move it to the top left. Uh, who here uses Adobe Photoshop? Like every time they release something, you're like, OK, all the keyboard shortcuts are different. <laughs> like, oh, the thing that I constantly go here for, it's not here anymore. So then you got to go search for it. And they don't care, because what are you going to do? Go to Paint Shop Pro? Ha ha ha. Right? <laughs> they don't care. You're trapped. I know, I know. We're, 
we're owned, that's it, right? PWD, is that the, anyway. So um, don't move the cheese is a concept we use to not piss people off. Now sometimes you have to. Sometimes you say there is no choice. I have to change the way that this product was working. Um, don't do it too often, and if you do it, be prepared for people to say, what the hell did you do? Because I was so used to it working a certain way, and when you do it, it better be for a really good reason. But what's interesting is Facebook has proven that you can change stuff, and the people freak out, and then, you know, squirrel, and then they're back to everything's good again, right? And so don't take that reaction too seriously, but at the same time, strive to keep things in the same place and work the same way. Strive for consistency. Again, it doesn't always have to be exactly consistent. I have a map here that shows exactly how this sort of works. So let's say we have the level of consistency over there is it's a pattern that we use all over the app. And then perfect for the situation is going up, saying, well, let's say B, totally inconsistent with how the rest of the app works. Um, and it's not very good for the situation. But A is great for this situation but it's totally different than the way the rest of the app works. Let's take an easy problem. If I'm comparing A versus C, and then a designer says, well, I want to do A because A is cool. Look how cool it is, right? You should not do A, you should do C because consistency is better even if this is cool too. Don't make the user learn new things. Keep the same things. Let them just repeat the pattern over and over because really, the, you're not the center of their universe. They have jobs and lives and Facebook accounts to update, and that you're not the thing that they're thinking about all the time. And so just making a new cool UI to you might be cool. To them, it's a new thing they have to learn. Interesting at Marketo, every time we create a new feature and I talk to customers, they're like, right? It's this weird look like, thanks. <laughs> you know, like, oh, it's a button. It makes money. <sighs> thanks, I guess. You know, like, you should start clicking on it. It's going to just, it prints money. Just click that button. And they're like, I know. I, listen, I'm, I'm doing a lot of stuff this week. <laughs> right? Can I do it later? Would that be OK? Can I do it later? And it doesn't matter what we come up with. It doesn't matter how easy what it is we come up with. To them, it's just some new thing that they have to learn and do. Oh, I gotta, every time I want money, i got to click it. And it's dollar bills. Couldn't it be 20s? I mean, come on. <laughs> right? It doesn't matter, because for them, like new features is new shit they have to deal with, right? So it's a, it's a very interesting take on features, because we all think, oh, we need to make more features. But from their standpoint, it's a very love-hate sort of uh, relationship with it. Here's the, and let's say you were going A versus D. The D is consistent, but it sucks for the situation. In this case, OK, fine. Let's go with A and let's make a new pattern. But let's actually do it official with like, we'll ring a gong and say, new pattern arriving, and that this is a new pattern that we're going to use from now on. And you make a big deal about it. You get everyone to agree on this new pattern, because that will become part of your stable. Because D just sucks for the situation, and you don't have an alternative. So in that case, fine. The hard one is A versus E. E is, you know what, I should have put E more over here. But E is consistent. But it's not quite as good. This is the time where it's hard, right? It's in the middle. Go with the consistent one. Take, suck it up, the fact that it's not the perfect UI for the situation. Because from the user's standpoint, having it be more consistent is more important than having it be fancy or perfect. right? Strive for consistency means lean towards the consistent one. It doesn't mean always have the consistent one. But it means that in the gray area, you know, benefit of the doubt goes to the consistent choice. Don't ask the user. You can ask the user to show them what they do. You can ask the user to teach you how to do their job. You can talk to them about religion and politics. But don't ask them what you should do. Don't ask them what feature would you like to see. What do you think we should build? Right? They have no idea. And they'll have strong opinions about their idea. They have no idea. There was a Sony um, very. Uh, famous uh, test. They had uh, people like yourself. They had yellow boom boxes and black boom boxes. Yellow Walkman and black Walkman. And they said, which do you think is better? Who do you think people would like more? And universally, it was yellow, yellow, yellow is awesome. Do you guys remember all the Sony yellow yeah. stuff? 
right? And then they said, thank you all. Back there is a whole bunch of gifts for you. You can take anything you want and go. And back there was a pile of electronics, both yellow and black, all mixed up together. Interestingly, no one took any of the yellow ones. <laughs> it's like, oh, no, everyone's going to like black. I don't like black, but everyone, everyone's going to like yellow. I don't like yellow, but the, people don't understand. There was studies that, into it that said it started off at the end. So how did you think about that task completion? And they say, oh my god, it was so easy. I love Intuit. It's so easy. That was the easiest thing I've ever done. And they said, rewind 40 minutes. She was trying to cut a check in QuickBooks, right? 40 minutes. And she's like, um, oh wait, no, that's wrong. And like, it just stumbling. I mean, it's really like a 30 second task. And she stumbled over it for 40 minutes. But at the end, she said, no, that was great. Right? You can't ask them what they like. You can't ask them what they would like. You can't ask them what you should build or what they would pay for. They are lying. They do not know. Think of them as gorillas, and you are Diane Fossey. Right? Oh, the silverback is coming. Let me see what that does. Yeah. You, you don't ask the gorilla, what does it mean to have a silverback? You watch, you observe, you learn. Customers are a great source of information. Just don't ask them to answer something they're ill-equipped to, to answer. Great book, uh, Predictably Irrational. He talks all about how people can't even remember 30 seconds ago. Was that painful? You know, like literally people give weird answers. You, they had a level five pain, right? And then um, one person had, wait, level nine pain. One person had level five pain, right? The level nine pain, at the last second, like the last couple seconds, they gave level two pain. And that was it. That was the whole experiment to say, like, how much pain did you experience? And all the people who had nine and then two said, eh, it felt like two. Because what they remembered was the last thing that they experienced. Same goes for applications or your product or any sort of interaction. You may love the product. You get this horrible letter from them saying you got to pay sales tax. And you go, I don't like them. Right? It's always that last reaction. People say it's the first impression that matters. I'm like, no, it's the last impression. It's the impression that they left with because people just stick with that. It sticks in their memory for a long time. One thing just about seating. This is actually a layout of the third floor of our building. We have the fourth floors and the fifth floors and the second floors. If you guys are interested in sitting in any one of these seats, let me know. I have cards. We're hiring in every single department. What's interesting is we put the UX team embedded with the engineering team. And the PM team doesn't have to be there. And the reason is we count on the UX team to be working with the engineers 100 times a day, constantly looking at the details over their shoulders, where we don't expect that from PM. We expect PM to actually work with a dozen different departments within the organization. They have to be working with sales. They have to be working with product marketing. They have to be working with support. They have to be working uh, all over the map with ops, with everyone getting all of these things launched, getting all these details uh, together, they don't really have the time to be spending 100 times a day over the engineer's shoulder just at that right moment when the engineer is saying, I'm not sure what I should do right here. Right? But the UX team, this is their whole job. This is all that they do. And so this sort of seating structure is part of the philosophy of what do you count on UX to do. It's to relieve the product managers of the burden of having to sit and babysit every little step that the engineers go through. That's their focus. Their focus is on the little details. Designers love the little details. Product managers very often do that, but that takes them away from all that other stuff. And the truth is, nobody else is doing all that other stuff. Nobody else is capable of doing all that other stuff. And that the better use of your time is all that other stuff. The details is where the magic happens. I've seen it 100 times. We worked on features for like six months. And that the customers say, oh, I love that. And they point at something that took like a half an hour. Right? And I'm like, why do you love that? And it was just like, but look at it. Look how cool it is. Right? And it's, people, people really connect to that one little detail. It's always the little detail that people love. Think about a car. Right? And you say, oh, why do you like this car? Right? I mean, think about how much engineering has gone into a car. Right? But what do people say? Oh, this seat is comfortable. Or the door, like, ka-chunk. Remember those things? Like, oh, ka-chunk. And, and now they make commercials saying, listen, ka-chunk, it's great. Right? Because they understand. That's what people love is the little details. Right? Obviously, the ka-chunk didn't take nearly as long as the engine. <laughs> right? And that's, but in any single application, it's the little tiny details that will make people love. That's the difference between like 
and fanatical loyalty. It's the little tiny details. Look in the Mac, right? And I, was, I read uh, Steve Jobs, that uh, biography that came out, and where he was sitting with the guy who made the hover on the, uh, the dock, right? Does that solve a lot of problems? I would say not, no. It's cute, it's nice, but how many people said, look, it's so cool, right? It's those little, and he knew, those little details matter more than anything else. All right, so we went through the idea part, the design part, the long tail part. I think I'm about 40 minutes in. Questions? <laughs> 